I think it usually takes about four or five days to climb the mountain. We were there for, uh, I think, a, almost a month. Because every along the way, we were getting stuck for five days, 10 days, three days, you know. So we got to do a lot of skiing in that month. And it really let me have a lot of introspective thought, like, what's next? How could I learn more about this continent? From NCAA soccer to a modeling and acting career to being the top polar explorer of his time, Doug Stelp's life is nothing if not enigmatic. The owner and operator of Ice Axe Expeditions first traveled to Antarctica in 1999 to climb and snowboard its highest peak, Mount Vincent. That adventure marked the beginning of a love affair with the white continent that's blossomed over the past 25 years. I recently journeyed to Antarctica with Stelp, and in this episode, our conversation ranges from Doug's personal training of A-list Hollywood actors to near-death experiences, adventures with Doug Coombs, and taking novice skiers to the South Pole. Times are changing, but our mission to be the voice of the backcountry skiing and snowboarding community remains the same. Now more than ever, we have plenty of important stories to tell, conversations to have, and thoughts to share. And if you like what you hear, please support the effort. Please donate now, give us a listen, and share these episodes. And we'll work hard to keep bringing you the stories that keep us all connected. We're offering levels of support to fit everyone's budget, starting at just $10 a year. For those of you who want to go big, we're offering the following three premium levels. For $50, you can get a Backcountry Magazine Supporting Listener t-shirt. For $100, the Supporting Listener hoodie. And for $150, a one-year subscription to Backcountry Magazine plus the Supporting Listener hoodie. You can learn more at backcountrymagazine.com backslash podcast. Thanks a lot, and thanks for listening. We'll see you in the hills. All right, friends, let's get into it. We hope you enjoy this new episode. Doug Stout, welcome to the Backcountry Podcast. Right on. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked for winter. It's right around the corner. We definitely need some snow out here in the, in the Sierras, but uh, it's uh, definitely um, looking promising and uh, can't wait to get the season off. We've already uh, fortunately, we had a trip down in Antarctica with you and uh, with your team, and that was just such an epic way to to start our season, pretty much. That's how we sort of look at it, um, even though it's sort of in October. Yeah, it was weird, you know, starting skiing in October, 10 days in before we would normally even be done biking. And then we come back and it's NCAA playoff soccer. And here we are, this last weekend, your alma mater, West Virginia against UVM, which I did not go to UVM, but it is just down the road, and we're proud of those boys. And uh, and they faced off over the weekend. Unfortunately, I was at the World Cup, not watching that, but watching Michaela Schifrin, et cetera. And uh, but you got to watch the game. How did it go? I've been sort of pretty close with my coaches, coaching staff. Yeah, the current coach is really young. He's only like thirty four years old, and he, was, he used to play for West Virginia. And so he, like 2007 through 10, maybe, he was on uh, the West Virginia team that was actually really, really good. I played back in 82 to 86, so I'm like an old, old fucker. And uh, so, but he's really embraced the alumni to come back. And I've donated a little bit of money to uh, the locker room and stuff like that. So it's, 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 I've been pretty close. I mean, I, I basically am texting my coaches you know, before the games and after the games and stuff like that. So I do have an intrinsic um, uh, relationship with uh, with not only the team, I know all the players, they know me, um, and also the coaches, coaching staff. So it's a little bit closer for me. And um, it was an amazing game against Vermont. Vermont is a, a very physical and large team. I think their forward is like 6'5". Uh, they got like nine of 11 players that are over 6'2 or 6'1, something like that. So they're a really gritty team uh, with some skill too. So uh, I think they probably had the better of the game, if I was being honest. Um, we did score in the first three minutes of the game, which really set the tone with uh, one of uh, our forwards, who's our two forward tandems, probably one of the best tandems in um, all of collegiate soccer. A lot of the players are from... Uh, overseas, they're, they're, a lot of them are a little bit older. Like in, they'd rather, t- I think some of the coaches are looking at foreign players that are 20, 21 years old that have played at a high level rather than grabbing an 18 year old that's played in high school. Um, I see that happening in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the elite eight. If you look at their rosters, they're going to be a lot of foreign players. 
Yeah. And, and older too, right? Like, so they, A, they've got that experience. B, they've got the maturity. You see this in ski racing, especially on the men's side. So it's pretty wild. Well, congratulations on your win. Yeah. To sort of to sum it up, we ended up winning two to one. Uh, and we're uh, off to the final eight, which will be in Morgantown this Saturday. And I'm actually flying in for the game against uh, Loyola Marymount, which is in uh, Southern California. So I'll go to the game and then I can't make uh, the final college cup, which is uh, in Louisville this year. They usually have a, a neutral site that they put together the college cup. I won't be able to make the Friday game, but only if we win, I might try to go to the final on the 11th, December 11th on Monday, but that's a long way away. And I don't know if we're going to make it that far. So, um, but it was a great, great, uh, great win against a, a really, really strong team and had a lot of fun watching. Right on. So, uh, as you said at the outset, I got to join you on your annual trip to Antarctica and it was mind blowing. Everybody asks me, they see the pictures of the penguins and it just blows people's minds, but you've been doing this since 2008. And, you know, we talked a little bit in the intro about, you know, your early life and, and some of the interesting stuff you've done. I want you to take us to when you first made that decision, when you were in California, you know, doing TV and whatnot, when did you decide like, oh, I'm going to go heli skiing in Alaska? Like, how did you get to that spot where you wanted that kind of challenge and you wanted to be around that kind of people? Yeah. Let me just go back a little bit. Um, yeah, I started doing, I, 2008 is when I started chartering the whole ships, but I had been going down to Antarctica since 2000, the year 2000. And so this was number, I think, 59 for me to actually go to Antarctica. And it was 39 to go to the peninsula. And uh, yeah, it, it's like you said, it's it's a, a ton skiing to wildlife. But for me, it's more about the camaraderie and the friendships that you make, like the one we're making right now. I, I mean, I think we'll be like lifelong friends, to be honest with you, just from the experience that we had together. Um, I think uh, to answer your question about uh, the start of Ice Axe, um, I had been sort of transitioning into a lot of outdoor stuff. I had um, I've climbed, I'd climbed in early or mid 90s, I'd climbed Denali on two different occasions and snowboarded. I did Kilimanjaro, I'd done Aconcagua, I'd done a bunch of mountains, bigger mountains, and potentially maybe looking at maybe skiing or snowboarding the seven summits. It was like a little, uh, you know, sort of a, a carrot that I was thinking about doing. And so after doing some research and finding out that uh, the Vincent Massif, the highest peak in Antarctica, 16,077 feet, had not been skied or snowboarded, that was a big attraction. And I was friends with a lot of people and uh, I'd been going to Alaska to when heli skiing was just starting. You know, the early 90s, I was going to ABA, which is a little parking lot at the top of Thompson Pass, and they would sell chips. And so these chips were these wooden chips. They were $25 a piece and that would give you a road hit. So the helicopter would be based in this parking lot, would lift up, take you to the nearest peak right at Thompson Pass there. And you would ski down and ski to the road and then they'd pick you up in a van. So that was uh, fairly inexpensive for me to be able to go up there. And it was really, truly, I'd skied all over the world and, um, you know, resorts and that kind of thing in backcountry. And, and so this was something that, you know, was mind blowing to me skiing super deep powder. Um, you had to ski, you had to snowboard it differently. You had, you couldn't be aggressive with your edges. You had to sort of feather the, your turns and always head on a swivel because there was slough management going on too. So I learned a lot on those first couple of years after getting swiped out a few times and, and you learn pretty quickly that that's not the way to do it. And uh, I met some amazing humans up there, you know, Doug Coombs and Mark Newcomb, Dave Swanwick. I mean, these, I could go on, uh, Rick Armstrong. Some of these guys were all from Jackson Hole, Wyoming and sort of became really good friends with them and started traveling. And after the Alaska season, I would go to Chamonix for a month. But the following season, during the season, I would actually go to, to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I was sort of living in Los Angeles at the time still. Um, but I did have a ski lease in Telluride for almost 10 years. So I had a car there and I would just sort of fly back and forth when I could and in between jobs and stuff like that. So it was uh, Telluride was sort of my base, but I did travel to go see friends and go, uh, you know, do some amazing ski and snowboard descents, whether it was the Grand Teton 
or whether it's just in uh, Thompson or uh, Teton Pass, um, did a lot of stuff in in the Tetons during those 10 years too. So, and uh, there was other things that Doug and I ended up doing. We ended up going to Mount Adams and Rainier and, and doing volcanoes and, you know, Three Sisters and all kinds of stuff. So we became fairly good friends. I was sort of like, he was sort of a mentor to me and uh, amazing to be able to have a mentor like that. And and uh, he had just started doing uh, steep camps over in uh, uh, Verbier as well, or I'm sorry, Lagrave, and he was doing stuff over there. So I didn't have a chance to go over there and be with him there, but I was planning on it. And unfortunately, uh, he's no longer with us and um, rest in peace. But, uh, you know, that was one of my goals to go over there and actually, you know, help out with uh, some of his some of his camps over there. But it was an easy transition. I, I was um, living in Los Angeles and hated the town and hated traffic. And so it was my release to be able to to get out of um, the city and, and get into nature. And these were sort of, um, you know, my pilgrimage to Alaska every year was like a month and then Chamonix for a month. And I had a lot of good friend groups and met some amazing people that I'm still friends with today. One of the things that uh, really captivated me and impressed me about the trip you do, you bring together on a ship, a 300 foot long purpose built cruise ship, 80 guests and media, maybe 25 guides, plus all the crew and the collegial atmosphere that exists in that setting. I have never come across anything like it. I've never been heli skiing, but I can only imagine the the guide culture at a heli operation or a bigger outfit might be something like what you see there. But then again, it's compressed into one week, you know, so these friendships that you can tell are years old and the, and the respect each guide has for one another and how, how the clients are just totally blown away by the culture. And then you have this amazing setting that is of course, Antarctica, but like, what made you think that this was possible? Because it's crazy. And when you started, it didn't go so well, right? Like, no, that, yeah. When I first started the whole ship, I had been going down on some of the cruise ships starting in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, but I would just have a small group on a normal, well, first two years were Russian research vessels. And then I ended up contacting like a company like Quark. And there was several other companies that I worked with that are no longer even around. And I would just hop aboard one of these ships. And when they would go ashore and do penguin rookeries, we would go skiing. And then they would come back and pick us up. So it was more of, uh, you know, pioneering skiing in Antarctica at that time, you know, and we're, I had small, really strong teams, usually North Face athletes, because I was, I was involved with the North Face at the time. And, and so we had all professional athletes going down there and filming and doing stuff. And it was just, uh, mind blowing, you know, and we, I was going at all different times of the season. The season really runs from mid October through all the way to, to March really. And so I had been down there all different times and I really had a dream, a dream of like bringing a hundred of my best friends. And that was really set in stone. Like the first couple of years, I was like, this is awesome, man. Let's try to do this. And I, I kept on dreaming about it. And then, and, and at one point in time, and, uh, I think after, um, I had done Vincent, I had done uh, a Choyu or something like that. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to try to charter a whole ship, you know, and uh, have my own itinerary and have a team together. And I did reach out to a lot of UIAGM guides in Europe and see if they could bring four clients. And that was sort of the model that I looked for. I did go to a couple friends that had heli operations because I'd been involved at, up in Alaska and I had a lot of contacts. And so I said, let's do a four to one and there is glaciation. So we do need to be roped up going uphill and uh, just sort of a leap of faith of uh, trying to say, build it and they will come kind of thing. And it was truly, uh, you know, 2008, we had chartered the ship and the ship came in at the beginning of the season and uh, the authorities in Ushuaia didn't deem it uh, suitable to go to the Antarctic because uh, it was antiquated because of, uh, you know, it's an older Russian research vessel that was converted into a tourist ship. And so they hadn't kept uh, up with the engines and stuff like that. So basically it came in smoking and listing to one side and uh, we end up getting on board and I had to stand up in front of a hundred people and say, Hey, we're not going to be going to Antarctica because the ship's not allowed to go. And that was a really 
crushing moment in my life to be able to ha- to have to do that, put all that energy and that focus and people's money and trust and all that to come down to Antarctica or come down to Ushuaia at that point and believe in ice axe and believe in me and, you know, to stand up there and say, hey, we're not going was uh, truly uh, one of the worst moments of my life. Wow. And um, so, but I did say that, hey, we're going to come back next year and we're going to come back stronger. Please keep your money in my company and believe in me and we're going to rebound. And we did. And so since then, it's been, you know, pretty pretty smooth sailing. And um, it's about the partners that you're with, um, not only the partners, the, the bar- partners with the boat companies. And they make, it's a very uh, fine-tuned project where there's several, several different levels. You got the people that are on the, on the ship, uh, all the housekeeping and the bartenders and the captain and the engineers. And then you have the boat staff that are basically a company, uh, whether it's Quark or whether it's Albatross. And they have staff that are sort of responsible for taking the Zodiacs to shore and making sure you're following all the IATA rules and that kind of thing. And then there's uh, the ISAC staff, which is basically just the guides. The guides are ISACs, and they are the ones that uh, are in touch with all the clients to be able to take us safely in the mountains. And so I, I, I'm really, really proud of the, of the guide team that we built. Uh, this year, we had 114 clients. I think you said 80-some earlier, but uh, and we had 32 mountain guides. So that was the biggest group that I've ever taken. And, you know, who knows? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'm super proud of my guide team. I think it's one of the best in the world. Everybody's from different countries and different places around the planet. We all have our ways to do it, but we all work really well together. You know, the snow science and the guide meetings are just so much fun to be a part of. And I, I think that you were privy to a couple of those uh, to see see the energy that's there. And it's uh, truly a special group of humans. And and um, something that I really look forward to almost every year just to hang out with my friends. You mentioned uh, IATA. Tell us what that ac- acronym means and, and how and why it's important at that. Yeah, IATA is the International uh, Antarctic Tourism Board. And what that does is um, they try to, uh, to maintain that the tourism is a huge thing on the peninsula. I think when I first started, there was probably only about six or 8,000 people going to visit the peninsula. And now it's grown to 40,000, even with two years of COVID with no visitation at all to the Antarctic Peninsula. And what they do is it's a consortium of, uh, of all different tour operators that work in Antarctica, whether it's interior or whether it's the peninsula, even in New Zealand, they got people coming from New Zealand over to, you know, the, the Ross Sea and stuff like that. So it's a group of individuals um, that own companies that deal directly with tourism in Antarctica. And we have to set up rules and regulations to make sure that we're not only protecting the wildlife, but protecting Antarctica. Antarctica is the highest, driest, windiest, coldest continent. It's pristine. It's clean. We want to make sure that we're not introducing evasive species. We want to make sure that uh, we're not affecting the wildlife and the rookeries that we're visiting. So there's definitely schedules that are set up for, for us to be able to go to visit some of these things. There's uh, speed limits in certain areas for the ships to maintain to make sure that we're not hitting any whales. Um, so it's a protection and preservation for uh, to keep Antarctica the way it is and not affect the amount of tourism that's going down there. And they uh, are very effective and they're doing a great job. And and um, ISACs, my company is not a, a member of IATO, but I work with all IATO companies. So I feel like we are pretty much responsible for the people when we go on land and we and we're uh, we're the only company that actually takes people up in the mountains which is really a, a different perspective to be able to experience antarctica that way and you know obviously we're using skis and snowboards to be able to get up there or snowshoes and so it's a it's a little bit different than most normal charters that are going down there so we want to make sure that we're maintaining uh the rules in play they meet every year um and create new rules and and go over stuff that went on to make sure we're maintaining that uh, that safety margins as well as uh, protecting the wildlife. And I think that's the real true reason of IATO. And uh, there is an Antarctic treaty that we do follow, and that's a basically 52, uh, 54 signatory countries. And you have to be a signatory country, you have to have a base located in Antarctica that winters over. So there's a lot of countries like the Philippines have a base and they throw up a couple air balloons, like weather balloons. Uh, maybe a couple times a year, and they have a, a vote. 
Okay. And uh, that's been since 1952. So in 2048, uh, the Antarctic Treaty is up for renewal and all the governments in Antarctic programs will decide what we do with Antarctica. And um, whether it's, uh, you know, depending on who's in office, it could be exploiting for its natural resources, which and economically, it's probably not that feasible. There is stuff there. There's oil, there's, you know, diamonds, there's all kinds of precious metals. There's um, ice and, and ice, it's, you know, 90% of the world's ice and 70% of the world's fresh water. So these are things that people, the governments are looking at. So, you know, it's uh, hopefully we continue. I'm in favor to keep it a world park for, for future generations. Um, and even, uh, even when I talk to clients on our ship, um, I said, we're only leaving a set of ski tracks. You know, it's one of those things where we want to go up in the mountains and continue to come back and not leave anything. And uh, so it is, and that's one of the things that blew me away. I don't know if it is with you that how, the, how clean and pristine it is. Um, you know, it's just one of these last frontiers on our planet that are just truly remarkable. And, you know, I can't wait to go in a couple of weeks. A couple things that, that stood out to me there, and I have been to the Arctic several times, and particularly in the north of Norway, and sadly, it's seashore, like many places around the globe, is covered with plastic and debris and, and whatnot. And, and it's not a Norwegian problem, it's a, it's a global problem. And I was delighted to see that it's not the case where we were on the peninsula in Antarctica and and can you explain why that's the case? Is it because of the Drake moving so fast? Is it? Well, it's actually mainly because what happens um, with plastics, they, you know, from other countries that aren't educated, you know, they float around and they end up uh, becoming microplastics. And there has been some studies even recently that there are microplastics even in the, uh, in some time in the Weddell Sea. Um, and what, what happens is, um, you have seasonal ice melt. The expansion of Antarctica expands 500 miles every winter. And what happens is that cold saline water that's melting dives deep and heads toward the bottom of the ocean and heads toward um, basically toward the equator. And then the warm equatorial water where there could be plastics is on the surface and heading toward the poles. Okay, so the southern hemisphere. Same thing happens up in the Arctic and when the, the whole uh, sea ice is melting, okay? And they call that thermohaline circulation. And what that does is that circular things or Gulf Stream, basically is what it is, can carry microplastics. And so there has been detection, obviously you can't see them, but you know, they take samples and there has been even, um, they found microplastics even in Antarctica, even though it looks completely clean. And, and, and it does, uh, we're down there early in the season where you can start to see the krill, the water is so clear and so beautiful and, and pristine. You can see whale bones on the bottom. Uh, you can from the whaling days. So uh, unfortunately, our planet needs to get educated and really understand that you know we need to eliminate single-use plastic and not try find ways to recycle or anything like that. We re just really need to use elimination of of uh, single-use plastic. I'm really proud of being one of the first people who started to really institute and tell some of the operators, no more plastic, no more straws, no more single-use plastic. If you look at all the operators now, they're pretty much all no single-use plastic anywhere. That's a good you know, stage to do, and I'm glad we're working in that direction, and, and hopefully it continues with more conservation and uh, other avenues. I think they are doing some recycling stuff in Ushuaia, um, big recycling plant to really try to help that tourist in industry as well. Right. Tell us about from when you first went to the peninsula, for our listeners, let's be really clear here that the peninsula, the Antarctic Peninsula comes up quite a ways away from the continent proper. And the continent proper is really what most people think about when they think of Antarctica, right? The giant ice sheets and just the miles of ice and barrenness. And the peninsula is mountainous and glacial. And it's, it's frankly, unlike any place I've been to. It's it's gorgeous. There's mounds that go up to 9,000 feet right from sea level. But you must have seen in your career a great deal of change down there on the ice side, on the glacial side. Does it look a, a lot different than it did when you first went down there? 
Uh, that's a great question, Howie. It, you know, not really. I think I'll, I'll just step back a little bit. Uh, my first trip was in 1999 in the interior, and there was nothing living. And it was to go climb, ski, and snowboard the highest peak in Antarctica. And I fell in love with the continent. Mm. I fell in love with Antarctica. We landed on an ice runway, and, you know, there's no wildlife. I think I've only seen in the interior, I've done, you know, maybe 25 trips or 24 trips or something like that. I've only seen one bird, you know, and that bird got blown in somehow, and he's probably not around anymore. But this is the only living thing other than a human that I ever witnessed in the interior of Antarctica. And we were climbing Mount Vincent, the Vincent Massif. It was an amazing experience. And, and uh, you know, they were serving, I think, like I get off, it was a C-130 at the time, landed on an ice runway, no brakes or anything, got to hit the reverse thrust. So they land on this ice runway. I walk 100 meters to this tent city, and they were serving like crepes and strawberries. It was 24 hours of sun, so at like 3 in the morning. And so I was like, where the hell am I? And we had a successful expedition to go climb, ski, and snowboard the Vincent Massif. We got stuck. I think it usually takes about four or five days to climb the mountain. We were there for, uh, I think, uh, almost a month. Because every along the way, we were getting stuck for five days, 10 days, three days, you know. So it was, we got to do a lot of skiing in that month. And it really let me have a lot of time to really uh, introspective thought, like, what's next? How could I learn more about this continent? and go places to go ski on this continent. So two months later, I chartered a Russian research vessel and went down to the Antarctic Peninsula and was freaking blown away. And I didn't know a lot of the peninsula, but I did look at uh, Google Maps and Google Earth and, and trying to figure out where the best skiing would be, that the mountains are right out of the water. And it seemed like that western side of the peninsula was the money, money pit. You know, there was definitely mountains, but also... Antarctica is really strange on the coast because you have glaciation and the glaciers are constantly moving toward the coast. And you need to find, there's good skiing everywhere, but you need to be able to get up from a Zodiac, get ramps to get up on the good skiing. So you can find ramps to bad skiing. You can find glacier walls that you can't climb up, obviously. Uh, there are sometimes three or 400 feet high. So you're, the key element is trying to find ramps that come down to the water that you can get up to good skiing. And then another problem is, is like it wasn't bad for just a couple people. There's all kinds of coulars and islands that you can ski if you just have a small team. But if you start adding uh, skiers and snowboarders, then you have to find places that have multiple ramps and multiple places to go to get everybody spread out. It would be really a bummer for you to come down to Antarctica and we have found one ramp with a hundred people in a skin track. That would be like, you know, not my type of trip that I'd ever want to run. So we're trying to find places where we can spread everybody out and be able to get to, to different locations with different dynamics of groups. Um, it's definitely not the place to go and ski the steeps. We definitely ski more low angle powder and that's great for everybody, including an intermediate skier that's never backcountry skied before. I think that's something that I'm seeing a more, a growing population on my trips that, you know, people want to ski Antarctica and they don't have a lot of experience, but it's almost ideal. Have I seen changes in from uh, an environmental standpoint? Um, no, I, I see the glaciers calving constantly. Uh, that's going to be happening for the rest of our lives and for many, many thousands of years ahead. I have noticed uh, through scientific experiments and just staying up on Antarctica that there are some large ice sheets or tabular icebergs on the Weddell Sea, which is the other side that we ski, that are pretty much calving at an alarming rate or at least separating. And, and that's not good news. I have noticed also the water temperature where we go has changed a little bit. It's rising a little bit, which is forcing the krill, which is that's what all the, the ecosystem feeds on, whether it's seals or whales or bird life. Um, the whole ecosystem re is relying on krill and the krill is moving. Penguins always go back to the same place and breed. 60% breed for life. And so they're going back to the same penguin rookeries, but I'm now starting to see in the 20 years I've been going down there, penguin, whole penguin rookeries starting to relocate, moving south with the colder water where the krill is. So this is something that I have witnessed a little bit, um, mainly through scientists telling me, oh, this is what's happening. Uh, the acidity of the water is changing a little bit too. So these are the things that, um, that are apparent to me. But uh, as far as like, 
okay, are the glaciers really recessing? I can't really tell you. I don't think that that's completely true. I think I'm seeing consist- consistent calving. And when that calving happens, you're, you got 50,000 year old glacial ice that's been at the, at the, basically at the South Pole, you know, 800 years ago, it's finally got to the coast. And so that ice, when it hits the water, is releasing CO2 and oxygen. And it's almost like Rice Krispie treats when you're going through in the Zodiac and it's being released, which is a really interesting phenomenon uh, to be able to experience that. Just on our way to get to the ramp to go up on skiing, I do notice that the wildlife is looking for these ramps too to get up and they're looking for nesting to be able to breed, especially the penguins. Uh, the seals like to get on ice sheets too to be able to lay out and uh, and just get sun and relax. They have to breed every uh, breathe every 22 minutes, so they like to hang out on a lot of the ice flows. Um, so I'm seeing some of that happening too, like where the glaciation's happening. Yeah, it's it's one of these things where I haven't seen a huge difference other than some other little things like the water temperatures changing and you know the wildlife is moving a little bit. I want to ask. So you've you've done so much when it comes to the cruise that you do every year, and you've done a bunch of polar stuff, guiding people blind and handicapped. But increasingly, and this is something, and I've been in this business a long time, I'm hearing for the first time this idea of yacht guiding, like where where guides like yourself and others get hired by someone that has the means to own a 300 foot long super yacht and they're going down there and other places. This is nothing new. It just seems new to me in the skiing world. Tell me about that dynamic and when that started to happen and, and what it's like doing that sort of work. You know, people see that there's some amazing skiing down there, which there is. I mean, the mountains come right out of the water, so that's very attractive to skiers. And you do have, uh, you still have to find ramps to be able to get on that stuff. And I've been doing it longer than anybody. So I've got a little bit of a long tooth uh, yeah. when it comes to that. So um, I've obviously been sort of a person that a lot of these companies, especially EOS, which is a, uh, a company that manages about 40 uh, mega yachts. And they've come to me to, to really um, keep people safe in the mountains in Antarctica. And I prefer the ski touring off these yachts. Um, it is a growing business. I think uh, just the introduction of sort of this expedition looking ship, not necessarily they have to be ice strengthened or anything, but the look of that is very appealing to a lot of yacht owners. And that industry is like taken off. And I think the combination of having a yacht, an owner having a yacht to be able to go anywhere in the world is attractive and thus the Antarctic yacht profile seems to be growing quite a bit. So um, I think I've been doing it almost six or seven years of working with yachts. I think we're, when I first started doing it, there was three or four yachts doing it and for a couple of years. And then there's like, you know, I think seven or eight, I you know, next couple of years. And to this year, I think we have, there's probably about seven, six or seven yachts that are going to be down there. I have, I think, 14 ski trips. So what EOS does is hires ISAX, my company, to be able to fulfill all the safety stuff when we go to shore. And so whether it's snowshoeing, whether it's ski touring, whether it's heli, uh, heli assist skiing, I put those permits together called a HAST permit that we have to apply to each of the government agencies that involve with the polar programs. So if it's an American company, I have to go to National Science Foundation and place a permit. And these things happen six months ahead of time and get approved by, you know, the National Science Foundation. So these have to be all really strict. And I'm, you know, I, I'm not a huge component in favor of the heli skiing on the Antarctic Peninsula. I think there's places for everything. And I think, uh, you know, should be ski touring, but it's, it's happening and for right now, and if it's going to happen, I think I, I'd like to, to be involved in it some way. So it happens in a really safe and, and an environmental way, if you can call it that. And so I have been involved the last few years a little bit more intrinsically with, you know, writing the permits, um, making sure that all my guides are following a, a strict protocols and um, keeping people safe in the mountain. And I think that goes on with, um, you know, basically a, an ice axe trip on the peninsula. 
you know, it's, it's, if everybody, if there was no injuries and everybody's safe, then that's a su successful trip for me. But it is a growing thing. I think, like I said, we have, I think, 14 or 15 charters. I think I'm going down on three of them uh, that I'll work on. And all those are primarily ski touring and we ski off the yacht. And they're usually only, you know, like you said, they're pretty large yachts with quite a few employees on them. And it's usually only eight or 12 passengers. So you got the, you know, the one percenters of the one percent and uh, coming down here and wanting to have a vacation with their friends or their family uh, and a, an amazing, beautiful spot. We uh, have to follow all the IATA rules, just like any of uh, our trips that would be. And uh, we're going down there. And, and fortunately for me, I have enough experience down there where we can go places that a lot of the other cruise ships go to. Um, we go elsewhere and we go where there's good ramps and good skiing and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, we can operate sort of away from the main Gerlash and some of the main places that a lot of the penguin rookeries that people go to and sign up for. It had sort of a strict protocol of like, you sign up at the beginning of the season that I'm going to be at this one for, I'm going to have a hundred people, these uh, tourist ships will come down and we'll have a hundred people at one penguin rookery at one morning and then they travel to another one in the afternoon. I tend to go to places for a whole day. Um, we'll station a ship in a bay that not a lot of other people are going to and we end up doing ski operations out of there. So it's um, a growing thing that's happening. We also do stuff in Greenland and Iceland and up in Svalbard and Northwest Passage and other places around the world. These, uh, the company EOS also works in uh, warm weather climates, whether it's Fiji or Bora Bora or Indonesia or wherever. And, and these yachts go all over the place. Yeah. Um, but these are called expedition ships. A lot of them are ice strengthened. Uh, there's an Explorer 77 and uh, some other companies that are actually making these beautiful yachts. I mean, I'm talking like a couple hundred million dollar yachts for sure uh, for owners. And the owners and, and usually will will take these yachts down to these locations, whether it's Antarctica, and then to offset some of the costs to be able to get it there, they'll charter them out for several weeks or months to really offset the cost. So a lot of these yachts, I said there was probably seven or eight yachts down there this year. A lot of them will have multiple charters during the season. And so we, if they want to ski off the yacht, then they call Ice Axe and Doug to try to put a team together. And I try to fulfill those obligations, whether we still maintain a four to one. So if there's eight skiers, then we have two guides on board and um, always two, even if there's only two people that want to ski. So we try to uh, have a level of safety to that these uh, individuals can enjoy their vacation down on the peninsula or wherever that might be, Greenland, that they can travel safely and be able to have an experience that they normally wouldn't be able to have. Well, there's hope for us all then, because I didn't know that I could charter one of these. I think the charter prices run from anywhere from probably 200000 a week to $2.4 million. So it depends on your price point. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I can't imagine doing a vacation for a week and spending that kind of money. I mean, even if I had that kind of money, I'm not sure I'd spend that kind of dough on something uh, for a week. And it is something special. You know how I, I'm, I'm in love with Antarctica, uh, but I don't know if, uh, I guess if I had, you know, billions and billions of dollars that I could even spend in a lifetime and 2.4 million is just sort of like pocket change, I guess. I mean, obviously you've done a lot of stuff on your own. You've done a lot of guiding and I want to hear, and I haven't asked you this yet. You and I have spoken a lot, both on this trip and before. I want to hear like some of your hairier moments. Like what's, what the top of that list look like? That's a great question because there are a few that stand out. And I think, you know, I, I'm a person that, you know, deals with a lot of risk management, you know, and so. Some of the more scary moments is when I was younger and stepping out and pushing safety limits, you know, and, I, and a lot of things you can control and a lot of things you can't. I think probably one of the scarier moments was doing a new route across Antarctica on the Filchner Ice Shelf and, and skiing across. And it's where Shackleton intended to ski from the Filchner all the way to the pole and then down to the Ross Sea. And I had a client and we were basically scouting and I would unhook myself from my 
400 pound sled and ski 100, 100 yards or 100 meters and probe and make sure that because crevasses are very uniform. If you look at a glacier and you look at the glaciation, it's usually moving in one direction. And when it goes over rocks, it creates cracks. And so you can determine sort of where those snow bridges might be. But you, if you have multiple glaciers coming in at different angles, it could be a mosh pit of different angles of different crevasses and different angles. And so when you put a little snow on top of that over the snow bridges, it can get a little pretty complex pretty quickly. And so traveling through these glaciated areas that no one's ever been to before, not that they would be any different if other people would travel because it's changing every, uh, you know, sometimes they're moving 30 or 40 feet a year. So traveling through there, you had some, you had to have some patience. Luckily, it was only about, you know, 60 miles that we had to go through to be, get through there. So it was only about eight or nine days and we were able to navigate through there. And I have fallen into a couple crevasses up to my chest. And I think that was uh, some of the more scarier moments and just trying to have a plan in place. If I did disappear with the client, just basically he had the sat phone and he was just going to retreat and not even come get me because we had a 30 meter rope and that was it. And I'd probably be on maybe 150 feet down in a crevasse. So there's no way for me to even get help <laughs> per se. So uh, we had a plan in place for him to just go back and call for, for help and go back to, you know, where an airplane could probably land and pick him up. So um, that was, I fell into four different crevasses on that trip. And I think that was some of the more scarier moments um, that I've ever been involved in. And, you know, those are things that, you know, I was probably pushing it a little bit and going through a new route that no one had ever done before and no one has done since then. But we did arrive at the South Pole was 737 miles and we did it in 47 days. So something I'm super proud of. And we raised a bunch of money for charity too. And I think that's one of the elements that I really love doing some of these trips because I can really sink my teeth into some of these charities and purposes uh, and education of uh, some of the trips that we go on. All my clients, I make them raise money for charity or I won't take them. So it's one of the things that keeps me going. I've been there, I've been to the South Pole 19 times. There's no reason for me to do 19 trips. So if I can have a, a really meaningful purpose and a meaningful for me to take each step or help that person get to the South Pole, whether it's a handicapped person or a blind person or someone just wanting to bring awareness to a certain cause, I think that really uh, makes sense to me. And um, I don't know how many more I have left in me. But um, I'll certainly uh, keep it there. And I do mentor a lot of people. And I think that's one of the great things that I'm looking at as a, as a sort of a way in, in the next few years is really trying to, to educate and mentor some younger guys to be able to um, not do what I do, but just try to mentor them in the sense that you can get involved in the outdoors and live your dreams and do what you love doing and, and try to help with that, with my connections and with my company and with uh, what I do. So. I do a lot of mentoring and I think it's leaving my own legacy in that way. I'd like to talk a little bit more about mentoring because I got to witness that firsthand. This young guy, Mateo, right? Yeah. Ray, here's a guy that reached out to you, as I understand it, or as I remember him telling me, reached out to you and said, hey, I'm kind of interested in learning more about what you do and maybe, you know, doing some of this work myself. And you're like, well, what are you doing next week? Why don't you come to Antarctica with us? And this, this guy hadn't really, really ski toured much. He let, he's from West Virginia, went to your school. And here you bring him and like, this is the kind of guy you are. Like, yeah, why don't you come on down? And this, and he's not the only one. Like, that's pretty amazing. Well, I think it's important, you know, to live your dream. And, uh, I have lots of success stories within that mentorship stuff. And, and it's really, um, a calculated thing. I mean, Stein Retzloff is a perfect example. He met me in Whistler. Not eight years ago and, you know, sent me an email. I want to do what you do. And I was like, well, Stein, it doesn't really work that way. You know, you have to gain skills and be able to show your skills to be able to get to certain levels of this. And there's a process that we can do. We can do a one-year plan, a two-year, a five-year, a 10-year plan, and you can get to where you were if we follow all these steps and I can help you along the way. So that's primarily what this mentorship's about. It's about coming up with a plan and actually fulfilling that. And I can assist with that. And we have, 
you know, weekly or monthly conversations. And I have probably about 10 or 12 people that I've successfully gotten to that stage. And I probably have about seven or eight that I'm currently involved in right now with just mentorships. Tell me about how this meant, I mean, you talked about Doug Coombs as a mentor of yours, and, and we've all had our mountain mentors and we hope to be one ourselves. In my little world, I, I try to do that. I got a young high school kid coming in here this afternoon to learn about, you know, writing and so on. And so I get that. What is it about athletics that, and, and I'm just thinking about you in soccer and, and any of the sports I've done where you're, you're close with coaches who are older. And of course, parents could play this role too, but I think it seems to me like that's where we learn the value of, of sharing and mentoring really is in athletics, or at least it's hammered home there. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. I've, I've been blessed with some amazing mentors, whether it's, you know, Doug Coombs or Alex Lowe or whatever. And, and you know, I, I don't think I was, I learned really young that if you surround yourself by amazing humans, whether it's athletic, smart, whatever, it's going to benefit you and you're going to be successful. And so I still do that today. I surround, I'm not the best athlete. I'm, you know, I try to be a really good guy, but I also surround myself with all kinds of amazing people and it really looks, makes me look good. So I learned that pretty early in my career and um, I continue to do that. And I know that I have, you know, some ways within my industry to help some young kids find their dreams too, that they probably wouldn't know how to navigate. And um, so I'm very helpful with that. And, you know, whether it's you want to be a paddleboard guy down in the Antarctic for the season, you know, and gain your skills or do educational stuff. I have a nonprofit that I've had to close down over COVID because I could, it's all international travel. And I've had several people get into outdoor education and I've helped them and they're doing amazing. They're on like a five-year plan right now. And they're one, I just had to write a, a recommendation for his PhD at, Va at Vanderbilt, you know, so he's actually done outdoor education with several different educational bodies and now he's getting his PhD. And so we're right on track with our five-year plan and he's on his way to his 10-year plan where he wants to have his own company where he's doing uh, youth outdoor education. So it's, it's really um, fulfilling for me to see how people are doing the steps that I've like tried to put in place and follow through. And, you know, you got to work hard, you know, it's not easy. And if they're willing to put the time in like I am, I mean, I wasn't the best soccer player, but I'll tell you what, I spent hours and hours in the garage at 10 o'clock at night juggling the soccer ball. And um, it's helped me out in my career and other things like whether it's uh, acting and for commercials, um, you know, I could say my name on camera and juggle soccer ball. And I was lucky to be uh, around Los Angeles for international commercials right before the World Cup. And I booked so many commercials for that. And I think that was sort of like a, a real way to get me into that industry or at least successfully get it. And I was booking commercials all the time. Then I'd work with a really well-known director on one of those things. And then he'd hire me again and again and again. So I did over a hundred commercials in front of the camera from 1990 to 2000. And it was really an easy thing for me to, to do. And it was uh, the way it's set up. You would, every time the commercial would run, you would get payment. And depending on the time of day that it was, it was like, so I would see myself on a commercial and it'd be like, ching, ching, you know, I was making some money. I'd go away on, go to Alaska for a month and go to Chamonix for a month. And I'd come back and I would have a stack of checks. And so it was a really interesting way that I could live my life very freely. I couldn't get anybody else to come with me, but I was on my own and meeting people along the way. And, but it was a pretty savvy way where I worked for myself. I was super successful with it and fucking loving life. I don't even know where to go from there because that is a unique, uh, I think about everything I've known about people in this ski world, let's call it. And I think your path into where you are today is maybe takes the cake. It's, it's pretty cool. It's very unique. And it's great that you're sharing it with people. I mean, let's face it, you've had good fortune, much of which you created yourself. Yeah, no, I've been very lucky. I'll tell you what, Howie, though, I'm, I'm not a huge self-promoter. You know, I, if I really probably wanted to, I could be a National Geographic explorer. I've done probably more expeditions than half those guys, you know, so it's not something that I want to achieve. I never wanted to be an actor. I never wanted to do any of that. I just sort of reinvented myself and did different things along the way, and I get bored easy, you know, so it was one of these things where I always was the boss and was able to control my own destiny do things really well, and then 
try something else, you know, and really work hard. And I have to tell you that, you know, it's not always easy, but you can do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. Yes, I've been lucky and been in the right place at the right time on 30 of the the jobs that I did through my life. You know, I think uh, that has a little bit of luck to do with it, but also a little bit of dedication and planning and, and preparation also for all my polar exploits. And uh, it's been, you know, a successful career and, you know, I'm ready to do something else. And whether it's mentorships or rather I buy a sailboat and sail around the world, I think that's one of my plans. And I have other dreams of, uh, I just was uh, talking to some producers and some uh, agencies about doing this thing called Source to Sea. And it's basically uh, start of the Amazon River is Mount Miss Me. It's an 18,000 foot mountain. I want to go climb it, ski it. At the bottom, I'll jump on a mountain bike and mountain bike to Puerto Maldonado in Peru. I'll meet my support boat and then paddle, stand up paddle 2,500 miles to the Atlantic and uh, talk about the deforestation, the indigenous tribes, the adventure of it all, and also the the wildlife. And so this is a 12-part series that I'm trying to pitch and I think it's going to happen, you know? And so it's one of those things where you set up dreams and you uh, dream big and dare to fail and you put a lot of energy into it. And I've been really good about making my dreams come true. And um, I think it's good. This is one of them that's probably going to happen before I die. Well, talk about an inspirational message to leave everyone with. Thank you, Doug, for joining me today. Right on. Howie, uh, everybody have an amazing ski season. And uh, I looked, uh, look forward to making turns with you and anybody out there. So uh, I'm based out in Lake Tahoe, but I ski all over the West and and sometimes the East. And uh, so hopefully we can make some turns together at some point in time and uh, check out Ice Axe. We do trips to Svalbard, Greenland, Iceland, Morocco, Kashmir, and of course, Antarctica. Thank you for listening and subscribing to the Backcountry Podcast and for supporting independent media. The Backcountry Podcast is produced by Backcountry Magazine, an imprint of Height of Land Publications in Jeffersonville, Vermont. Backcountry's small but mighty staff works hard to bring you stories that are beautifully produced, thoughtfully edited, and thoroughly fact-checked. Betsy Monero is our editor-in-chief. Mike Horn is our podcast producer and engineer. Our music was composed by Alex Paul. Please consider supporting independent journalism by subscribing at backcountrymagazine.com. Use code PODCAST for 10% off your entire order. I'm Adam Howard. Thanks for listening. Until next time, we'll see you in the backcountry. Backcountry.